Hello everyone, welcome to a session where we're going to be looking at the design of tension elements, specifically focusing on block shear and failure mechanisms that go around it. Once you have these concepts, you should be able to apply them in pretty much any, any setting. But I find often people misapply uh, the concepts of block shear in terms of calculations, simply because of lack of understanding or lack of being able to visualize what physically happens to a tension element as it fails. So we're going to be going through a, a simple example now, looking at how we would get to, to the resistance of an element. All right, so here I have a angle, this, this blue Play-Doh angle with some four yellow bolts in it, and we're putting a tension load on it. So there's a force pulling it in this direction until the point it fails. And you will know it fails if you can have two separate pieces of the element. So you pull on it to it fractures, because as we discussed previously, either you'll get a gross failure there, so it'll just um, fail all the way through the, the gro total cross-section. It can fail on the cr net cross-section. And remember, net we have to adjust for shear lag because there will be uh, parts of this outstand flange which are not effective due to the fact that there's a low distribution from the bolts. But now, let's have a look at block shear. So we, we get to the stage, we, we load it, we load it, we load it. And um, let's say now you decide, all right, here is, is my angle. It's, I'll just remind you, this is an unequal angle um, with four bolts here, and um, it's, it's connected to a blue gusset plate, as I've got shown. And let's say now you pull it, and you pull it, and you pull it. And one thing that I've seen many, many times that students do, they will say that it will fail along a plane that looks like that. So basically, this piece will be will break off, and then you will pull this through. But at this point in time, when you, you look at that, you should start thinking, hold on, something's not right. So what many people I have seen done over the years is they would say, here's the, it, I've folded it out now. Um, so they would say it has a failure plane all the way there and then down and down. But you look at this and it's still fixed together because I'm pulling here and there's still low distribution. These bolts are still holding on. If you pull on it and it, you decide on a fracture position and you still are connected from the load to the bolts, you have a problem. You actually haven't identified a correct um, failure pattern or block shear method because it would have to fail that and the bolts. So it's unlikely to be the lowest. So that is not a, a failure pattern. So um, let's have a look now at another failure pattern. So let's say we pull on it, we pull it, and pull it, and gets to a point where either it could have a straight, a straight cut all the way horizontally, straight through the section. Otherwise, what we could have um, is then a failure with also this diagonal um, sort of step in the way. So we fail all the way along the, um, the section, all the outstand, upstand flange diagonally between the two bolts and across. In reality, it's quite a, a pain to work out what's exactly happening in this, this diagonal piece. And so we have a way of accounting for it by adding on a little bit extra. Um, S squared over 4G. Um, you, you have the, a little bit of an extra term you will see applied there. You multiply, or well, you add on um, a bit of extra to convert a horizontal, because we can easily work out what's the effective width horizontally between the, the whole section, or what we do is we take the distance horizontally between the two bolts. We get that minus of the bolt diameter, so now kind of have a projected area. But what's happening here is a diagonal, so the line gets a bit longer, but also you've got a mixture of tension and shear. So all we do is we approximate the sort of combined tension, shear, and length area by adding on a little bit extra. So the horizontal area we include, plus we add on S squared over 4G. That S squared over 4G is just to convert a straight line here into a little bit extra for the diagonal and for all the, the failure that's happening there. So when we get this total pink failure plane, as I'm showing here, it's the total width of the, the, the section times the thickness minus off two bolts, because we've got two bolts, plus S squared over 4G times the thickness. And just remember, when you add on that S squared over 4G term, that is a width. 
So you must multiply by thickness, and that's a common mistake, the S squared over 40 times the thickness of section. So we want to account for the sort of diagonal failure plane there. All right, so that would be then a failure plane through a diagonal section. But now let's have a look at um, some other ones. So we could pull and pull and pull on our, our angle again. And we get to the stage where we could have um, block shear now. So we pull and pull and pull. And it starts now yielding and fracturing along the various lines. And so we get to a stage where that, along with that, would come out as a unit. So it would sort of pull off. And we would be left with this setup as we, we have here. Um, it wouldn't be as neat as I've shown it, but we can approximate it as a neat system. So I'm going to just remove the bolts. Um, so we end up with a sort of rather funny shaped little block that's left over. When it comes to any section, always think sum of forces. In structural engineering, always think sum of forces. And if you can add up the sum of forces, then you will have the you know, chances are you're going in the right direction. So we've got a shear failure along that face, a shear failure along that place, plus tension, plus tension, plus a little bit extra there for that diagonal. So the resistance is a shear resistance plus a tension resistance, plus a little bit extra for the, the area, um, but we're just going to convert it into pure tension. So tension plus shear, and that will give us the resistance along this plane, and then we have to have a look, either it's gross or net, and as discussed previously, it depends on what we're doing. Uh, the, the gross area, we will take up to a yield stress, a net area will take up an ultimate stress, because then we're actually allowing fracture, so we don't want the whole... Um, now, we don't allow the whole area to go across yield, but we allow little areas to go all the way up to fracture. So that would be then how to look at a block shear failure in the section and how to get it. And just remember, it's always sum of forces, shear resistance plus tension resistance. So putting this back together, so there is our, our connection once again. Um, I'm just going to mark this up on, on this one. So what we were having there was I did a block shear. Now I'm looking at the green lines here, all the way up, down, and across. So a section got left behind when the rest of the section pulled out. And uh, start thinking about now also what patterns wouldn't govern. So I showed you earlier, um, for instance, this piece at the side breaking off, that wouldn't govern because it's still bolted. And another common mistake that is made is instead of getting the front line where it would break and have an effective net area, people often put the back line. They put a line through that last line of bolts. And coincidentally, you often end up with the right result because it is a net shear, you have one bolt and it's all, all fine. But it's actually wrong. If you show your line of failures here, this is incorrect. Because if I fail the, in theory, that section there all the way along the back here, it's still connected. I still have a load being applied and then three or four bolts still holding it in place. So that will, will allow it to, to be strong enough. So that takes you through then just looking at some uh, just some failure planes, failure mechanisms and block shear in terms of a section. Just to preempt future discussions that we will have, we ha we're not going to look at it in this section of the course, but start thinking now, when I fail this, when I put um, load on this until it fails, what would be the influence of the bolts, or when would the bolts possibly fail? And so uh, what may happen is that, here's my bolts again, we load them up, we load them up, we load them up, and now they're being pulled along. There are a couple of failure mechanisms that I'm just going to jog you, uh, or get you thinking about. For instance, here's one bolt removed. As we pull and pull and pull, we may get to the stage where we actually have a, some sort of bearing failure. We may um, fail in bearing and, and have a pull out failure. Um, then we may also just shear it all the way through. We pull and pull and pull, and if I was looking underneath this between the two, it might just snap and pull all the way through so you could have a, a shear failure and then or you might have a pull out failure so rather than the bolt bearing against the um, steel and actually fails the the material locally if this bolt is too close to the end you can actually have a pull out failure where it actually goes and then it, it pulls out but that's to get you thinking about some other failure mechanisms that we will discuss later in the course <laughs>